Welcome to Community Church Online Worship. It's the fifth Sunday of Easter, May 10th, Mother's Day. A special blessing to all you mothers out there today. A few announcements this morning. We are planning for reopening. Now, we don't have any dates yet, but just to let you know that uh, we are taking a look at what needs to take place uh, to open uh, this worship space to the general public again. And uh, again, we'll be constrained by what the, the rules and regulations are, but we're sure it's going to look a little bit different. So we are doing some pre-planning there. And just to let you know so that we're ready when we get the green light. In the meantime, we have, starting this Sunday, Mother's Day, May 10th, a windshield worship. Yes, this is worship in the parking lot from our vehicles, staying in our vehicles. We'll have a sound system set up, so hopefully you can hear the worship, and we'll be doing that at 9.30 at our normal worship time, starting this Sunday, May 10th, and continuing into the foreseeable future. So coming down to the parking lot here at the church, 9.30 a.m., stay behind your windshields and we'll have sound out and uh, welcome you to worshiping in a new way during COVID-19. Let us prepare our hearts for worship this morning in this call to worship. And Jesus said, come. To all mothers and all children, he said, come. To the motherless and the childless, he said, come. To all who long to be mothered, he said, come. Come unto me all, ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Our first readings comes from the book of Psalm and 1 Peter this morning. Psalm for today comes from chapter 31, verses 1 through 5 and 15 through 16. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning is from 1 Peter 2, verses 2 through 10. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts 
of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Our gospel text this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to Philip, Have I been you? Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And in fact, will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're continuing our sermon series, Risen and Raised. And this morning in this text of John 14, Jesus tells the disciples not to be troubled. So our message this morning is raised above trouble. Now, I've got a bit of trivia question for you this morning. The year 1970, do you know Billboard's number one hit single of 1970? I was raised in a bit of a musical family and dad had this album. The next clue, Simon and Garfunkel, Yes, the number one hit single, 1970, was Bridge Over Troubled Water. When you're weary, feeling small, when tears are in your eyes, I'll dry them all. I'm on your side. Oh, when times get rough and friends just can't be found. Paul Simon shares that his inspiration for these lyrics came actually from a gospel song, Mary, Don't You Weep, as rendered by the Swan Silvertones gospel group. Now, these contemporary lyrics of Paul Simon's are expressed musically and artistically a little differently than Jesus' own words, but the sentiment is the same. I recognize that what you are going through is a struggle and I will not abandon you. Like the song, the first thing Jesus does to the disciples, see now this is on the night that Judas had just betrayed Jesus. They're sitting at the table, having this beautiful Passover meal, and he tells the disciples that he's gonna die, and he tells them that they'll betray him. This was the trouble that they were dealing with. And the first thing Jesus does is he validates the difficulty. 
He doesn't placate the disciples with oft-heard expressions such as, it will be okay, it could be worse. Think of those who are suffering more than you. I know what you're going through. Or my personal favorite, let me tell you about my troubles. Now Jesus certainly could have used this line. Think about what he was about to endure. The actual betrayal by the disciples, the trial before Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate, whipped, beaten, crown of thorns placed upon his head and his death on the cross. He was certainly living the most troubled of waters. And his concern for the disciples is solely focused not on what he will endure, but on what the disciples will endure. The Simon and Garfunkel song continues, like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. Jesus says to the disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe God and in me. I'm laying my life down for you. In two days, he literally does that, not only for the disciples, but for the entire world. In his own words, Jesus says that he is the bridge over the troubled waters. And in the following verses, he affirms that in three ways. In verses 1 through 6, he affirms that he's a bridge over troubled waters in that he has a place for us. The bridge actually leads somewhere. Why should I traverse troubled waters? Why take a road that God has laid out for us? Because it leads to a place that he's preparing for us. This place in heaven that God is making just for us. But what is a place for us if we don't know how to get there? Jesus then reassures that he will take us to this place. And if there is a place and we know how to get there, what would be the motivation for going? And Jesus says, I will be there. This place that he prepares, this place to which he will take us, is the place where Jesus will live and reign with us forever and ever. So Jesus first reassures the disciples that they have a place in heaven. Even in their betrayal, God is now preparing a place for them. But he not only reassures them by that they will have a place someday, he reassures them that he is the way. In response to Thomas's concern about how do we get there, Jesus? Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. These last three years of following me and healing people, and casting out demons. Yes, I am the Son of God. When you feel like wandering from this path we call Christianity, Jesus says, I am the way. When we are confused by this world and all the other voices giving us ideas and commands, Jesus says, I am the truth. And when this life seems hopeless, when life seems empty, when it's lost its meaning, Jesus says, I am the life. Jesus is the way in our wandering. He is the truth in our confusion. And he is the life in our hopelessness. So he reassures these disciples that he's got a place for them. And he reassures them that he is the way to this place. And lastly, Jesus gives them purpose. 12 through 14. I'd like you to read these verses, verses 12 through 14. And then these three verses, you find the verb 
do five times. You will do the works that I do. That's twice. You will do greater works than these. That's three times. I, Jesus, will do four times. If you ask in my name, I will do it five times. Knowing that God is at work in us can be reassuring in times of doubt, in the times of COVID-19. Knowing that God is at work in us can be reassuring to us that we are part of the kingdom of God. Knowing that God has a plan not only for the future and that he is the way, but that plan is for today as well can reassure us in times of doubt about where we stand in the kingdom of God. Jesus reassures the disciples. He does not placate them. That God the Father has an eternity place for us. That he's provided a way through his son Jesus Christ to get there. And in the meantime, he's got some pretty important work for us to do. That is God's bridge for us in these times of troubled waters. He elevates us above the trouble with a destination, with life, and with purpose. May God bless us on that journey. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came not only to die for us, but to live again. And in his life, we have that life. And we thank you that that life is for today, to carry us and to sustain us today and tomorrow, to carry us to that future home through your son, Jesus Christ. So God, we ask for your blessing upon us. Lord, no matter how difficult the waters, no matter how deep the waters may seem. Lord, no matter how turbulent those waters are around us, God, you are our help and our salvation. God, be that bridge for us. We pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy Mother's Day to every woman. Thank you, Pastor Scott, for inviting me to share a few thoughts today. 
one of the titles that is nearest and dearest to my heart, the one that means the most to me of all the titles that I've held, all the things that I've achieved is mom. And it's by far the most important to me. Being a mom is the hardest job that I've ever done. And really the one that I have loved by far the most. Without a doubt, it is my highest and most sacred calling. And I know that as moms, sometimes we have said enough. Whatever that has meant at that time, we have said enough. And I want to talk to you a little bit about enough. I became a first time mom just before my 30th birthday. And having had the opportunity to watch lots of other moms parent their children, I knew exactly how I was going to do it. I had this long mental list of all the things that my kids were never going to do and all the things that I would never do as well as always do. I was ready to be a mom. I was married. We had a house. We had a dog. I had checked all of those accomplishments and now I was ready to be a mom. For those of you wondering what was on my list, well, my kids were never going to wear Velcro shoes. And I was always going to say what I mean and mean what I say. But, well, one of my boys wore Velcro shoes. And I have said maybe more than once when what I actually meant was there is no way we are ever going to do that. And where, where did that list come from? You know, I think that every woman, as they enter into being a mom, they're really worried about and think a lot about what they say. And who are they? What is they comprised of? Well, it's the books that you read. It's the magazines that you look at. It's what your friends tell you, what your mother says, what your mother-in-law says, and what that lady at Walmart came and told you. All of this is the collective they that we begin to measure ourselves against. And it starts right away. Baby milestones are like medals of honor that women wear with pride. He holds up his head, check. He sits up, check. He feeds himself, check. It's checking off those list of milestones that becomes like our mom report card. Are you passing or are you failing? Are you doing enough? What else should you be doing? So let me tell you that Nate was this super skinny, colicky, fussy baby with acid reflux and a chronic rash. He cried regardless of what I did, and I tried everything that they suggested. And at the same time, there was this baby in our church that was a month younger than him, and Lucas was this little butterball of a baby that was content to just sit and look around. So at that time, every Sunday, all the moms with babies, two and under, we sat in the nursery. And one Sunday morning, Lucas's mom put this little butterball of a baby down on the floor in front of her and proudly proclaimed, look, he's sitting up all by himself. And another mom that had six kids, matter of factly said, he's not sitting up. He's just leaning on his belly. Well, the baby indeed was upright, uh, but the truth is that Lucas wasn't supporting his weight. His weight was supporting him. And the difference between how his mom saw it and how the other mom saw it was their perspective. 
his mom was so proud of his accomplishment. It made her feel like she was doing the right things. What, meanwhile, the other mom was just seeing it for what it was. And I think if we're honest, that's how, as moms, we often measure ourselves. Are we a good enough mom? What are we doing? So I want to tell you that it's been amazing to have Graceland become part of our family because this year, in February, Nate turned 13, and Graceland turned one, and I have loved having a baby again. And gone is my long list of nevers and evers. My perspective has changed dramatically. And I know that I've shared with many of you that one of like the best things about having the baby at this point in my life was that I really don't care what they say anymore. Uh, I've rocked her to sleep. I nurse her on demand. I've even let her sleep in our bed. This time, I don't feel driven to measure my worth and my success as a parent against what they say I should do. I have now learned that I have fewer answers now than I did before I was a mom. And even though I have fewer answers, I think that the one I do have is a lot better because regardless of how old your children are if parenting doesn't drive you to your knees are you really doing it right you know my boys now have their own list of nevers to be honest there's never enough of a lot of things in their opinion there's never enough time to sleep there's never enough time to play there's never enough time to play nintendo never enough food when it comes to ice cream, chicken wings, or uh, Doritos. But it seems that there's a new mantra out there that women are subscribing to, and it's you are enough. You're enough is the flag that's flown over moms and women everywhere, regardless of the avenue that they're traveling down. It's no longer breast is best, it's fed is best because you're enough. It's you want to keep your career and put your children in daycare, that's okay because you're enough. It's you want to leave your career to stay at home and raise your children, that's okay because you're enough. It's even gone so far as you want to go to Walmart with uncombed hair and your pajamas and your kids with breakfast on their face. That's okay because you're enough. It seems like the perspective has shifted from am I doing enough? Am I accomplishing enough? To I don't need to put forth any effort to be enough. And one day I was praying about it and I felt I was feeling bad for myself. It was one of those whining prayers. It was like, Lord, it, I, I'm just never enough. What I do is not good enough. The harder I try, it just, just doesn't seem to work. I'm just not good enough. And I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, of course you're not enough. I'll never be enough. As moms, we're never going to be enough. As humans, we're not enough. We take pride in accomplishments of our children, whether they're infants, teens, they run the fastest mile, they're adults with the biggest, best career, because that all goes towards filling that hole in our heart. But the truth is, that's a God-shaped hole. That hole exists in our children as well. And that hole is never going to be filled with anything that we can accomplish. 
And it doesn't go away when we simply say, I'm enough. I don't need to do that. I don't need to measure up to your standards. I'm enough. But you still have that God-shaped hole in your heart. It's like trying to drive a round peg into a square hole. It occupies a lot of those spaces when you feel like you've accomplished a lot or your children accomplish a lot. But you still have that hole. And it's not filled by doing, by finding, by success. The only thing that fills that hole is giving, giving our children to Jesus, giving our own lives more wholly and completely over to Jesus and realizing that we aren't enough. He alone is enough. He supplies all of our needs, the Bible tells us, and my righteousness is as filthy rags. So the harder I try, the less I let Jesus change their hearts, work in the situation, teach them something. It's only through surrender that we find it fills that spot. Surrender isn't giving up and not trying. It's giving it over to God and letting him fill up that place. And sometimes our boys have questions that make us feel like we still don't know what we're doing. I told Nate, yeah, sorry. We've never had a 13 year old before. We're just kind of making it up as we go along. And, and that's okay because we're telling him it's all about Jesus. And we do have serious conversations. And our boys have some other questions right now in this season. How long? Is this coronavirus thing gonna last? When are things gonna go back to normal? When can we go out to eat again? And in this season that we face right now, I just wanna leave you with a thought and I wanna encourage you to realize that Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough peace. Jesus is enough comfort. Jesus is enough strength to get you through these days where you're isolated from your family physically and your friends. He is rest for your burdened mind, and he is enough to take you through whatever might come. My prayer for you today is that Jesus will be your enough. That's the lesson that being a mom has taught me the most is that I need to let Jesus be my enough. And now as we leave, a Mother's Day benediction. May God who gave birth to all creation bless us. May God who became incarnate by an earthly mother bless us. May God who broods as a mother over her children bless us. May Almighty God bless us now and forever. Amen.